Hello and welcome to the Geek on My channel. We are going to be doing book three of the Completionist Chronicles, which is Rexus the Side Quest. Oh, by Dakota Crow, read by Luke Daniels. Uh, read that part. All good. First one of the series by Luke Daniels, who I thoroughly enjoy, but it definitely threw me off. Yeah, I think he did the same thing for uh, the Divine Dungeon series. Yeah. The same narrators that came through halfway. Yep, yep, around the same time. So... I remember when this title was first announced, um, I initially was a bit disappointed. I, as much as I'm a fanboy and I enjoy it when they add to the universe, I really wanted the main storyline to be uh, continued. Yet, now that I've gone back and re-listened to it a handful of times, Jackson is just so much fun to hang out with and the fact that at the end of book two we officially got the 
um, I don't know, announce, I guess it was an announcement, right? With Cal where it came out and it officially said, Hey, universes are connected. The divine dungeon and the completion chronicles are one realm. Or that was on there too. Yes. That's, I'm sorry. Did I say three? I meant or two. I, yeah. You're good. Yeah. Yeah. So in that sense, this book was a lot of fun because we get to see Tom's people. Um, well, I don't know if you can technically count them as Tom's people. Cause I think Tom stayed a human right at the end of book five mm-hmm. of the divine dungeon. Yeah. Yeah. It's the people, which is where Tom came from. But when we knew him, he was primarily banished, but then mm-hmm. we get book five of the divine dungeon is kind of his, uh, backstory or origin story right so in that sense this book was a lot of fun to kind of hang out with the wolfman and there's another title that focuses on the wolfman that i don't think we've gotten around to yet which would be a lot of fun to check out um i think it's like the bibble Bibbleist or, or something like that. Biomancer or whatnot. Maybe. I, I, I can picture the title, but yeah, we haven't yeah. picked it up yet. Yeah. As well as um, the sideline story of the Divine Dungeon. Um, Art- oh, Artorians. The, uh, love and Sunshine, her pillow yes. mage. Our pillow, love and sunshine mage. Right, we need to is... catch up on all those. We do. We do. We're working on it. We are almost current with the Completionist Chronicles. I still have not yet listened to Ruthless, and you have. So oh, man. I'm, I'm a little jelly. Bad so much. Yeah. This book does, too, though. Yeah, we really yeah, get to see more of the world. We really get to see more of Jackson, understand his backstory a lot more. And understand the video game mechanics that much more because we get point of view from Jackson and see just how much of an impact his charisma uh, impacts the game, right? Yeah, this book... So that's one thing that Dakota Kraut does very well. In book one and two, we understand that having a negative modifier affects gameplay. Mm -hmm. And we get to see a little bit of it with Joe where, okay, food costs more. Okay. You know, he's got to tip so much to keep a reputation with the couriers. Uh, The bath costs more and just, we get to see that side of things, but uh, oh man, he does such a great job because the very end of two is the very beginning of three. So we get to see the same interaction from both perspectives and then, mm-hmm. you know, spoiler, going forward, the end of three is the beginning of four. And it's just very unique the way the interactions work. And it's primarily mm-hmm. based off of the charisma. But we also get to see, or for me, it uh, emphasized a lot on the um, perception because he has a very low perception. Oh, man, I, I wish I had the, the quote pulled up for this, but where... He's got his hands out, and uh, right after he comes out of the oh, people killer dagger dungeon place, and he's like, don't move. My hands can't see you <laughs> if you don't move. And the guy's like, what? And then yeah, the higher perception, his hands have higher perception, so they end up locking onto him. The yeah. old, uh, T-Rex adage. Yeah. Anyway, but this book does very well emphasizing that. Mm-hmm. And then as forward and backwards as it is, I almost feel like I run into situations like this in real life where due to not necessarily due to perspective or perception and charisma, but due to life experiences, there's a lot of verbiage that I tend to use on a day-to-day basis. Like whoever is the team lead and whoever has to put out the fires and deal with all that, you know, I was like, all right, you get to tank this one. And they're like, what? Uh, No, no idea what I'm talking about. Yeah. Yeah. We've, we've talked about some of this stuff before though, about how um, 
spending so much time with video games and just kind of like viewing the world through that filter, how applicable <clears throat> it is to real life. And I know that they're in a video game, but for some of them, it's so much their real life. Like Jackson is a 92 year old man. So he pretty much lives inside this game. So it's his reality. And in a lot of ways, the, the gamification of it, um, back and forth and forth and back. Uh, we, we talk about it all the time, like, oh, got to go uh, grind out some experience or tank this yeah. or uh, level up that or, oh, man, critical failure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, uh, and that's one of those weird things, too, because for lit RPGs, I really enjoy a lot of the immersion and this one does it very well, but also on a different level because we do know Cal and we do know kind of his humor and his mindset. And we see that through the notifications. Mm -hmm. But the reality is like, this is a real world. So they paint it off and they play it off as this is a video game. But that was just the transport layer. So mm -hmm. anyway, yes. Rexus. Oh, man. So <clears throat> Jackson is just fun throughout the whole thing. He's just like, oh, I don't know where I'm going. Spins around in circle, <laughs> points his fingers like, oh, well, it looks like we're going that way. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Puppies. Yeah. Well, wait, uh, that isn't a thing. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, he is so awkward, but lovable. Um you really get to see where he's coming from in this book. And, uh, oh man, trying a blank. The girl that tries to kill him in the or beginning. Jessima, or Jessamine. Jessamine. Is that who it is? Who ends up teaming up with him. Uh, eventually, after she realizes how bad his stats are when it comes to social skills. Uh, she sees him for the cute, lovable old man that he is, where he is just like the introvert of introverts who in real yeah. life doesn't have the social skills. And then you add on his poor charisma where the game literally changes what he says and changes what he hears. And we get to see that from him his perspective where the mouth movement and the words don't match up. Right. Now that is another thing that I, I'm not sure on the physical copy and I would need to look at it, but when you're listening to it, there's, this is where the narrator does an amazing job and you get that kind of like tonal difference where it's almost like a sarcastic as he's saying it. And that's where, you know, the game is changing the verbiage. Mm -hmm. He also, Dakota also um, goes through and kind of emphasizes like, oh, the mouth didn't move, match up or, oh, the, his mouth stopped moving before, you know, all this happened. But yes. I'd be curious if it's like italicized or underlined or has some other indicator to say, hey, this is not what actually is happening. Mm hmm. Yeah, it's it's just so much fun. Yeah, it's a really, really quick book. Um, only six hours long for us listening at faster speed. You can get it done in an evening pretty quick. Yet it adds so much lore, adds so much backstory, and we get a new party member, um, yep. which is nice. And again, like Jackson, he's just such a lovable character where he really doesn't know this girl, and yet he puts himself out there for her, right? So that is a great segue into, I have a quote, and there are several just great grand life lessons throughout this, and maybe I'm overanalyzing things like always, but... Uh... That's what Listen we do on this channel, right? Do you think we took too long of a break there? 
Jess questioned as they hurried along their chosen path, slowed only by the need to go around any trees in their way. If we somehow did take too long of a rest, would it help us in any way to ruminate on it? Jackson tossed a response at her, and she went silent for a few minutes as she thought about it. The silence stretched long enough that Jackson was actually starting to feel comfortable around her. Then she started to speak. I guess not. Maybe that is my real issue in life. I always think on the things that I did instead of the things I want to or should do. Jess paused and licked her lips. I guess wisdom comes with age, huh? That's not wisdom. That's common sense. Or at least it was. The past is the past. The present is gone. And the future is all we have. Jackson grinned about his revised sayings. You think your past is what has been holding you back? Or would you like it to be what is holding you back so that you have an excuse not to try? Excuse me? Jess raised her brows and <laughs> dared Jackson to continue speaking. Done. Jackson nodded at her words. All is forgiven, then. From what I've seen, you have some talent as a tactician. It's unrefined, and I think you freeze up mid-combat. Either that or you're really quiet. You have admitted that this is what interests you. What is stopping you from applying to one of the big guilds and getting training and experience? Nothing. Now? Jess quit, hoping that playing this off would make Jackson go silent so she could focus on running. You're bringing me on. Yes, yes, but before that, you were planning to settle into a guild you didn't like, doing things you didn't like with people that are pretty unlikable. Jackson had a concerned look on his face when she dared to look over. Again, you have a talent that may- Anyway, so there's a lot there. And essentially, the, the past is the past, the present is gone, and the future is all you have, so dwelling on it doesn't do you any good and for me i guess i kind of always you know said it similar yet different where i was like is it out of your control you know if it's not something that you have any control over why are you letting it control you and yeah, yeah i was just yeah amazing quote um we always like to analyze just story those little nuggets in the books that we read. And this one is no exception. Um, the narration Luke Daniels is phenomenal and you really get to appreciate it there in what was that one X? Yeah, that was at normal. Now for somebody that typically listens in two X, did it mess with you a little bit hearing it, it go so slow? It did, but yeah, that's where I was. Yeah, I just took longer to get through the section. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, it's all good. <laughs> Gotta love those that that frame jacking, um, which we could talk more about that uh, next week when we go back to the Bobaverse, which I'm excited about. But back to Rexus. The oh, go ahead. Or I don't have anything other than I really enjoy that quote, and I've got one more. All right, you want to play the next quote? Okay, let's do it. Just don't hate me, old man. Hmm, I must be giving off an old man vibe again. Jackson looked down the tunnel and took a few steps. I don't hate you. A lot of people seem to think I have the time and energy for that. Nope. I either like you or don't think about you at all. And so that is another very powerful quote. And I see people in my day-to-day -day life let other people control them. Where someone will say something, they'll take it personal, and they'll just get completely bent out of shape and let it ruin their whole day. And now they're all, you know, beep to beep, and they're taking it out on everybody else. Where me, I take the like extreme in the opposite direction, where 
when someone's coming at me like that, I'm like, this isn't even about me. You know, you must really be having a bad day or your life must suck. The fact that you're attacking me like this, like, I know I didn't do anything. And if I did, then I would own up to it. I'm like, OK, sorry, you know a lot on my mind and I reacted poorly and I own up to it. But uh, yeah, just so many people in life take everything personal. And I guess that's where this whole project for geek on my sleeve, people need to read more that way they can empathize and that way they can see things from a third party perspective, because if someone's coming at you and, you know, screaming or whatever however they're trying to attack you you know for me i always take a step back and i'm just like hmm they probably you know woke up late and almost got in a car accident coming to work and you know their significant other spending all their money or whatever whatever other real world irl problems going on and they're just you know i'm just the outlet yeah so yeah. It's another very powerful quote. I agree. I agree. And with a lot of these characters, I catch myself when I'm in interesting situations, kind of like, hey, what would this character do? How can I channel this energy? So coming soon to the Geek on My Sleeve shop, what would Jackson do bracelets? <laughs> WWJD. So minus the whole socially awkward moment, hmm, this person is going berserk mode. Their rage meter is on full blast. It's not even about me. They yep. have just been taking damage and building aggro all day. And now that rage meter has just peaked. So all I got to do is dance like the 92 year old chiropractor made of jelly until their rage meter goes down. I lose aggro and I can forget about them and move or, on. Or like uh, <laughs> that snake moment where he's like, Oh, did you know snakes like to sunbathe on trails? Well, I was doing flips and I, I landed on the head of a snake, <laughs> like a certain red hatted Italian plumber. Yes. And then he ends yes. up uh, dodging it and essentially um, taming or not taming, but uh, charming the snake. <laughs> uh, there's so many fun, um, not safe for work um, jokes in this book. Yeah, that one too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I couldn't help but get a chuckle out of um, that scene when they finally do get to a river to bathe. Yeah. That um, one one-eyed snake yeah and all the uh after he gets his rexus hands his living weapon hands um all the uh the jokes about taming his hands and and doing all that fun stuff and oh man wait your regular hands have name <laughs> right lefty um, and terror uh, the uh <laughs> oh the whole like initial time they meet where jessman's like wait, what? What's going on here? What's up with this table thing? Yeah. Mm. Anyway. Yeah. It, but again, it's, it's another lesson there. Um, you know, people in, in a lot of those moments, it was just simple miscommunication, people making assumptions, and more often than not, they were the wrong ones, right? And, and that's where I run into that language barrier as well, because I tend to over explain things and people are like, well, why did you have to say all that extra floof? And it's like, because I want to make sure that you understand where I got here, because if mm -hmm. I don't explain this, everybody else is confused. Uh, that's the management experience coming through because i ran into some of that as well where it's like hmm when in doubt over communicate and explain and it better to have too much information than too little information and then they can go and complain about it anyway but at least it's not on you right yeah so um yeah but with with jackson and jess 
there was a lot of miscommunication there, but the game mechanics also added to it, right? Not only was he yeah, yeah, was like old charisma. dude and and you know younger girl, but the charisma playing into it, um, the mismatch, perception. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So yeah, one in doubt. Like the moment when Jessamine tries to snap his neck and his head's facing backwards and he's just like are you licensed for this i'm, I'm pretty sure i have a higher skill level that did yeah, nothing that's... for me it's just like oh my <laughs> <laughs> you know what kind of person is this if he didn't even perceive that as an attack Hmm. Hmm. yeah um so I want to talk a little bit about the lore and what all we learned in the book. Okay. One, one of the moments that really kind of hit home for me and one of the reasons why I enjoy going back and rereading, re-listening to these books over and over again is like after you get the storyline down, you're kind of able to um, kind of listen with half an ear and go to that next layer of abstraction and when he meets up with uh, the wolfman and she kind of indirectly manipulates him to, to be a guard for the puppies and everything, and they, they get back there, we know the backstory of the people and how they are now the wolfman and how old they are, right? Because yeah, it's old race. Mm-hmm, the Divine Dungeon from what we can extrapolate with the series is the completionist chronicles. It's very much along our current timeline, right? Could take place maybe a little bit in the future, maybe current um, time. If it went a different direction for technology or why. Uh, So we know the people have been alive for a while. And then when we get the noble quest, I believe it's a book one the queen let slip that they were essentially everybody was fighting everybody and they were put into like a stasis or like a timelessness where they didn't sleep they didn't dream they were mm-hmm. nothingness and then when they came back and then i guess also when uh joe first enters the world the lady's like, oh, welcome to the newly found kingdom of Ardania. She's like, I don't know why they say that, because it's been 200 years. So it's really yeah, only been 200 years in this world. Well, only been 200 years since they got awakening out of stasis. Yeah. Right. Um, and we know that time moves quicker. We don't know how much quicker, but time moves For quicker. Two times. Oh, you're right. Two times, but that would only equate for a hundred years on the outside. So Cal must have woken them up a little bit before they actually got released um, from the chaos chain. Or well, I'm not still a hundred percent on that because when. Oh, the guy on the oil rig ends Mm. up looking at it. It looks like it has chains on it. But then when he connects it to his computer and it transfers like so many exabytes of data, I'm not sure if the chains come off or he's able to tap into his cultivation somehow. Because with Chains of Chaos, you can still think and you can still cultivate, but you can't move. Right. So I don't know. And that's, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so the people, characters, quote, NPCs inside the game known as Cal have been around at least 200 plus years. We know that they've been around for at least 200 plus years since Ardania got refounded, reforged. Um, and my snap cam seems to think my big old ears are glasses. Yeah, it keeps pulsating over. Oh, yeah, it keeps spasming okay. I out. remember where you're going now. 
yeah about the uh wolfman shaman obaba and uh when jackson gets to the place he's supposed to go with the other people he's like oh what'd you save obaba from was it the king or the queen attacking her and then uh when uh, Jackson's communicating with her, he's an old man and she's, you know, old for the people in the race and mm -hmm. she's a curmudgeon. No yes. wonder we got along so famously. And it's just yes. like the old people and their lingo and communicating and yeah. 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 Exactly. And it's kind of a fun little perspective on it. Like what is real? Who who is real? Um, because even though they are characters in this game, they were people that escaped from the divine dungeon. Right. And even though they have been conscious for at least 200 plus years, they quote physically, even though they're not physical or they are physical inside Cal, they've been alive since, uh, longer than our current perceived time, right? Because oh, they were... Yeah, that's a whole interesting theory. Sorry, side note. Because at the end of the Divine Dungeon series, we were interacting with S-rank beings, and even when you enter into the mage rankings, they are perceived to live for hundreds of years. And then when you hit the S-tier, like... They're going to be around forever. Mm -hmm. And I think the master was S tier. But then since the way he got accepted into Cal soul space, he actually got like reset because he couldn't get through Cal soul space because it was, he had more power than could successfully transfer. Mm -hmm. But like, on the scale we're talking at the end of the the divine dungeon we've like barely scratched the surface like they're talking elves who had their whole population cultivating and everybody was living for hundreds of years the human nobles who were perceived to be a child up until like 30 or like 20 something where you know in our perspective that's pretty old to be still considered a child but had to do with the power scaling and once they reach a certain level so like it's cool and all what's happening and yeah we got our first specialization and yeah things are different but oh man there's so much more power that we can have and yep. since we know that's where the basis of the races were before they got here granted not everything's the same and kind of at the end of it all where they finally get into Cal and they're utilizing their powers and it's just dissipating into the ether because Cal's so efficient at absorbing it. So power scaling is going to be different, but under with the understanding of once you show that you have the knowledge, just like how Jackson is a master, once you show that you have the knowledge, then yeah, he'll accept it. Yeah. And we get to learn of some of Jackson's, uh, not necessarily hacks, but advantages, like with the skills where he denies getting them and gets the um, skill, skill points, points. Yeah, that's... to be used. Pretty interesting. And then... And the... oh, go, go ahead. ahead. No, go ahead. All right, so the next point I want to talk about was the dungeons. And I haven't been able to make the connection. In the very first dungeon, he goes into the trials with a flaming eyeball. I'm mm. curious if one of the other side series Dakota has would lay or give insight to it, because almost every other situation, I'm like, okay, that makes sense, and that's what that is. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. The flaming eyeball, I, I didn't have a connection. It could just be something of this world, but I feel like it, because it was so like mysterious and the fact that it might be a temple, but it might be, you know, power of a god or whatever, and they've never been able to prove it. 
that's where my mind went as well. Like, is this a dungeon? Is this a divine being, you know, a God? Because at this point in the series, uh, in the divine dungeon, we know that once they reached S rank, they were in the spiritual rank, right? Where they no longer use, uh, was it cultivation? They no longer use mana. They are now like the spirit of their law and they utilize like spirit energy quote unquote very very loose outline there um if i mess that up correct us in the comments below yet like you said the the people in the s ranks struggled to go into the realm and if they did they were in like some kind of crystal quote unquote so the mages were bound into the crystal that way their power could go through because it was lowered but the s rankers for barry and the master signed a soul pact with Mm. cal so they weren't able to bring all their power in but he was able to bring their soul in which is what they are right right so we know that those guys are now deities in this world so as you said like they well, could be we know the, the eye. master is but we don't know what he did with barry and all that uh come on come on okay, like okay. Uh, know, you're right we, we they haven't spelled it out but it's pretty safe assumption right like uh in book oh, man, two like, I just barely that's got to be madame chandra right like the one with uh, uh, no the that's, bear. that's not no oh no, oh, no spoilers no spoilers Nah, yeah, it's it's Spriggan as in like tree. Does it get spelled out more um, in book five? Yeah, but it also gets spelled a little bit in it's either one or two. I want to say it's two when Joe goes back to or when he realizes that he's stronger than he should be. Mm. And he goes to talk to Ockel Totem. And when he gets there, he starts to see the little flowers sprout. And what threw me off was the pronunciation. But when he's talking to Akultatum, the hidden god, in the flower, he's talking about the flowers. He says, it's nice to show or to see that I'm gaining power. Did you know Chan, or he says like Chandra, is not actually a tree. She just has so many followers that you know, it's always continuously growing. But then when we see the lady Spriggan with a bear pun guy, I can't think of his name. um, She, her power is waning and she has like no power. So, Mm. and then ruthless also spells out a little more further. Yeah. We're not there yet. I didn't, I didn't didn't say it. We're, we're working on it. We're not there yet. Um, So, rexus yeah we get the lore we get to see the wolfman people we get to see jackson who is so bad at communicating with humans actually is a little bit better at communicating with wolfman like he's still pretty bad but he's able to deduce how to initially communicate with them by mimicking uh dog actions and so he learns some of the basics right and then baba yeah, and gets a quest reward for yeah speaking part of their language oh, yeah man, the way they tie it together in book four mm, beautiful anyway. yes yes we'll we'll get there we'll get there maybe next month maybe the following month but we'll get there and yes one of the things that I enjoy is just the dungeons because the abstract rewards. And then it's one thing that's hinted at that isn't really laid out. And since we know what happened in the divine dungeon, we assume it anyway. Mm -hmm. So as of now in the completionist chronicles, we see them as NPCs, but the fact that the wolfmen are telling Jess and Jackson hey, okay, you can go ahead and go on instead of refining the people 
because you're going to respawn there. And Jessamine's like, if I die, I'll die twice, once to the trials and once for the Wolfman killing her. Mm -hmm. And that's when Jackson has the horrible charisma stats. And it's just like, can you believe? And Jessamine's like, they're going to kill us. They think we're going to die. They're going to eat me. And he's just like, they think we're cute. <laughs> what? What'd you say? <laughs> anyway, but due to the whole circular circular logic there, the wolfmen understand that when they die, they will respawn here. So the fact that the NPCs will respawn and then we get another hint when Jessamine's old party is tracking her and they have the Wolfman oh Tom Tom navigation or whatever. Yeah. And she's like, Oh, I hope my people are the ones to find you and you inevitably respawn and they end up killing her and she's smiling. So we assume she respawned over there. Mm-hmm. And so that's unique about the trial space, or it might just be something that both have, which I assume it is. Mm -hmm. Might also depend on the layer of, uh, oh, kind of like if the soul bond they gave to him. Yeah. Yeah. Jackson is striving to be a completionist like Joe. Yeah. And, um, really looks to him as a model there and just his overall attitude. I think we all could aspire to a little bit in life where, Hey, if you're going to pursue something, pursue it to the best of your ability to complete it and do well at it. And it's funny to kind of watch Jackson, how he goes about it. Like the first time he um, attempts the trial as he takes on the level one skeletons and lets them attack him time and time again. So he can like study the, yeah, the... blows as they come at his face. He's like, what skeletons? Um, and just how long he takes there. And then, oh man, when, when he gets to the, uh, the mini horses, Oh yeah. I want to <laughs> hitch them all together and uh, have the cutest uh, mode of transportation, but that's not viable. And he completes it. And it's like, you have completed this trial with a, uh, Oh, it's some morbid thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, I can't remember anyway. So he gets an additional 5% because nobody else has, used another mini horse to be <laughs> another horse to death. And it's just like, wow. Yes. Yes. Use the tools and resources at your disposal. And when he gets the hunger and thirst debuff, oh, what does he yeah, do? Pokes <laughs> a hole in one of the mini horses. And mm, this is sushi. Oh, mm. it's just a really moist sushi. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that also quenches my thirst. Yeah. Mm. And then he ends up with uh, the seepage three later on. <laughs> He's like, eh, I don't think I'll live long enough for the gastrointestinal distress. Uh, but due to his perception, which is another big thing, it's not like super emphasized in this book, but due to uh, his perception being so low, He's not as impacted with his health getting super low. He's still able mm. to fight through the pain where that's just something that's done beautifully for me because through the other books where Joe is the primary, Joe has a higher perception. Plus, due to his class, he's got even higher or more heightened sense mm -hmm. for everything going on and uh it, it allows jackson to thrive and to do other things yes and then due to him being a completionist we kind of get to the second dungeon and you know we know that this is where the um player killer group is getting their daggers where they're able to loot an item from people and oh man that so it's a fun sorry. crawl back back up sidestep we take out headshot i think book two might have been book one 
Yeah, yes. we take him out book one, but then we see him again book two when Joe goes to the uh, oh, prison for his psychomancy thing and mm -hmm. he tries to stab him. But he's, yeah, anyway. So we dealt with the first baddie of Headshot and mm -hmm. now we have Back Attack Beast Spain, which we got insight or info of at the end of two for being one of the sorry i keep touching my boom arm and my cable is acting up um at the end of two where he's back attack b spain is the third highest because mm -hmm. it's joe a10 or a10 and then back attack b spain so he was a high contributor there Right. And now he's trying to be a player killer guild. Because mm -hmm. Jackson tries to buy out our debt, right? Like, here, what if I just give you a sack of gold? Or yeah, whatever? why can't I give you a sack of gold and buy it off? Anyway, so this is our next uh, Madeira's who's going to show up in every episode and twirl his mustache. Uh, I see what you did there. But uh, uh, there's just that whole conversation is so funny because he shows them the, the daggers and it's an upgraded form. And Jackson's just spitballing and he's like, oh, hey, let's you gain XP for killing people. And he's like, what? How do you know that? And then they get going further and he's mm -hmm. like, oh, hey, let's shake on this deal. And he's like, what? How do you get out of your bindings? <laughs> people underestimate him, um, but he's a genuinely good dude jackson um, yeah trying to help jess out um going in and risking being permanently deleted to attempt this dungeon which the dungeon crawl is just a lot of fun and again jackson's approach to the game trying to complete everything is like forget this like yeah risk of death but let's try to beat it and it pays off in the end yeah. right like they go through and oh man, there's so many LOL moments. Like when Jess gets the uh, crit shot on um, the really, really big guys where the only place she could reach is uh, oh, yeah. yeah, they're, they're nether regions and they Jess and Jackson kind of have a fun little friendly back and forth. Um, and oh man, Jackson's just got so many good one liner slash like, dad old man jokes uh throughout this book it's just uh dakota kraut and his puns and yeah yeah i i really enjoyed how smooth the um bet jackson has at the end there with like his living weapons and the uh, yeah. uh the arm wrestling moment like uh he he, yeah, he predicts it all yeah 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 beautifully executed and beautifully just, executed the fact that so this is i I've, I've played quite a bit of breath of the wild and it is a game that depending on your perspective you can do things that you wouldn't think would be possible for example, you can do it the way you're supposed to and complete the little trials with all your abilities. Or I found a couple of random videos where you can take a bomb and you can attach it to a balloon and so it'll float up. So then you can jump, blow up one of the bombs, do like a shield surf to get you an extra flip. And then that second bomb that you put on a balloon, you can swap over to and blow up and you can like launch yourself across the whole room over the wall. So instead of doing the correct objectives to get to it, you can just anyway. So Jackson figures out that due to the quotes in front of it, where it's like, oh, the wicked run when nobody is chasing or nobody's following. I can't remember all the quotes, but he's mm -hmm. able to decipher it and understanding the guild who's trying to control this place and what their motive and their end game is he's able to take a different perspective which you know cripples the guild more or less they're no longer able to get the daggers or upgrade the daggers 
Yeah. Which is quite interesting. I don't know if that's like the end of, you know, these guys because we kind of crippled them. Oh, you know they're going to be going after them, though. But the Wanderers Guild is a noble guild. Um, yeah, yeah. They definitely didn't make any friends throughout that process. That's for sure. Yeah. Um, oh, man. Typically, we do MVPs for the stories. But I mean, uh, we got there pretty much a two characters. Lot of characters throughout it, but you know, I guess technically Jackson is a side carrier throughout the series. Just certainly helps, though. Yeah, and in book three, she's pretty clutch and does stuff. But book four, mm, she uh, is pretty unique. And mm -hmm. I can't say more. Next time. Next time. We're almost there. We're almost yeah. current with the series. You, you've been itching to get there for months now. Um, almost. Almost there. Uh, with that said, what else should we talk about with this book? It's so short, so quick. Yeah, get a, it, it does a lot for including or adding lore for the Beastmen, or not Beastmen, the Wolfmen. Mm -hmm. um, it kind of gives an insight to, you know, for future events, Jackson hopefully will eventually get to a positive or a neutral alignment, which will help us out. Wink, he, wink. Uh, the, he earned a lot of experience. Like, he was very selfless with... Um, what he did for the Wolfmen, like he negotiated, he got quests, yeah, but he pretty much like gave them materials, like he gave so, them meat yeah. that they could survive for up to a month without um, resources or whatever. Yeah, right? yeah, the like, main warriors have gone off to fight in the war. One mm -hmm. thing that didn't add up for me, and Dakota, I don't know what you were thinking. But in the trial place, there are trees that if you get too close, they attack you. And then there are monkeys, which monkeys climb trees. But that's the primary way that Jackson ends up defeating the monkeys is by throwing the monkeys at the trees and having the trees finish them off. Uh. <laughs> so I was just kind of like... How do you climb a tree without being able to climb a tree? And why are you monkeys? So that didn't add up for me. Um, kind of, kind of, kind of, whatever. It, it made some sense for like the fling poo as they're trying to climb up the tower. Uh, but uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It didn't didn't quite add up for me. He he makes pretty fun worlds though. Dakota Kraut does. Yeah. Yeah. That was the only qualm I had with this book. I enjoyed seeing the different uh, trials Jackson went through for the first dungeon and how Jackson's trying to decode it where he's like, okay, this is supposed to be a moral battle for taking out, you know, duck sized horses. And he was afraid that there was going to be a horse sized <laughs> duck. Um, <laughs> And then where he's about to obliterate someone, but they're like, oh, you know, please don't kill us. And then you run into the oh, kitty kitty chain gang and they're all like, yes, we are going to defeat you. Meow. Uh, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. uh, too fun. Too fun. Oh, I'm like, uh, I enjoyed the whole damsel in distress act for the second dungeon where <laughs> yes. Jackson is just like, uh, I can play the damsel in distress. Honestly, I don't know why that's so looked down upon getting saved right now. Sounds great. Mm -hmm. And as, uh, I think she, she, or maybe I'm thinking of the previous book where he's carrying, um, Poppy and the princess carry, but he flutters his eyelashes and everything to Jess and like, Oh, my hero. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. 
Yeah. I think one of my big takeaways from Jackson in this book is you can't take yourself too seriously, right? Like uh, people are going to rage. They're going to aggro. Don't waste your time and energy on them. Don't waste your time and energy on things that really don't matter. Like don't take yourself too seriously and just focus on your goals, your objectives and completing your, your mission and your quest. Right. Oh, yes. And that's where I had a secondary quote for that last one I played where he was pretty much like, oh, you must think I hate you. No, I either like you or I don't think you think about you at all. You played I've always it. said it a little different. For mm -hmm. me, it's always been like, you're not my wife and you don't pay my bills, so I don't have to care. So most of the time I take the benefit of the Dow role where I do my best to be accommodating and understanding and explain it to the best of my abilities. But the moment people are upset or, you know, attacking me for it, you're not worth my time. And it's kind of a weird perspective, but it helps so much because a lot of the base nature for the fight or flight mentality comes into play. So if someone's attacking you, it's, you know, you get that fight or flight reflex and, you know, normally it's fight for verbal battles or whatever, mm -hmm. but at the same time, you know, they're, they're not even worth my time when I put it into perspective, like I'm not going to lose my job for this schmuck or whatnot. So mm -hmm. just uh, that one really hit home and grand life lessons throughout these books and why people need to read more. They do. They do. Um, a little less Netflix, a little bit more audiobooks. The world would be a better place. So, plus it's easier to multitask with audiobooks. Just saying. Just saying. Yeah. So, so um, that probably is going to be a whole like side series for like quotes to live by and i've wanted to do this for a long time but i haven't had the quotes and i've been really bad about pulling them out but now that i've got a base of a couple quotes where i could easily talk on them and i could be like this is this character from this book and here's a general situation play the quote and then express different viewpoints on the quotes and how you can apply it to life as a whole. Yes. Yes. Because that's kind of our mentality drive for this channel is read more books. Why you should read more books. Hey, how about you check out this book uh, and come talk to us about it. Yeah, yeah. Let's geek out over some books. My book, Dragons, which, unless you got more on Rexus, would be a great transition into the hype train. Oh, or you can hype. I'm going to click buttons. All right. Hype train for next week. So one of our earliest hard science fiction books that we have done is... Bobaverse. Really, really fun book series. Really great lessons and perspectives. And AKA Search for Bender, AKA Heaven's River, AKA Book Four by Dennis E. Taylor of the Bobaverse is out. We have listened to it. We really want to talk to some people about it. We got so kind of a synopsis, spoiler free style. If you've Throw read down. book one and you remember Bob interacting with the Deltons and trying to figure out that whole situation, it's book four is very much that the search find some different things, attempting to interact with them. But it's kind of the difference between playing the Sky God, which is book one, and James Bond, 
this is very much a James Bond, you know, covert op type mission. And that is my best analogy that I can think of. There are a lot of things that have a big impact on the Bobbleverse as a whole, which ends up having critical job parameters affected. Uh, and, and honestly, like I wasn't super thrilled when I first went through it, but at the same time, due to the pressures of everything else, it, it works out well. I thoroughly enjoyed it. It is the James Bond esque version of finding new life. Baba verse book four. Yeah. Please tune in next week to uh, dive deeper. Yes, yes. And all the geeky references that are in there. I caught a lot. I'm sure you caught a lot. Um, probably not quite as many as actually are out there. But yeah, yeah. If you haven't already, pick up, binge the series. It is well worth it. And we will be geeking out over it next week. Currently at our normal time of 8 p.m. Eastern. That's always subject to change. So like, comment, subscribe, follow us to stay up to date on all those lovely pieces. Did I miss anything, Pete? Mm, nope. All right. Thanks, everybody who joined us for the live stream. And thanks to everybody who watched this after the fact. Bye. Bye.